Okay, I said, Mr. Director, I'm going to sue you again. I've talked to the attorneys because I'm hearing not just me, but the other guys are getting it. And I said, this time, no more good guy. We're going to, and it's, it's going to be devastating because you can't say you didn't know. And I said, you have not taken corrective action to punish these people. And I'll tell you who they are and where they are and what they did. I'll help you. That's what I just gave you two inspectors. Well, Matt, you're angry. I said, no, I used to be. I said, my blood pressure went to 210 over 110. Constant. They would send me home. This is after the law, after the lawsuit. I said, send me back to the field. I can't. I'm going to die here. He says, okay, Matt, where do you want to go? I said, see, you're supposed to send me where I'm needed. That's the way it works here. All right, he said, there's an opening in Albuquerque. Everybody that came into power brought their own group of people. But once you start getting into promotions, then you see it's good old boy. It's favoritism, which exists everywhere. But I was naive to think it didn't exist in the FBI. Since my family was pretty good in politics, there, there was no obstacles. It shocked me to really see firsthand uh, the notion of um, selling yourself for politically, I guess I would call it, for whoever's in, whoever says, you know, and the, the things were said to me like, just, just take it and we'll take care of you. And I said, no, because that's against the whole notion of being an FBI agent. We've known about political appointees for a long time. My father was uh, close friends with a governor back then. Where the unit that is responsible for kind of like weeding out the wrong type of character to enter the police department. I went in straight. <laughs> no paperwork, no nothing. They're basically set aside by upper police management and ordered to pass through these individuals that have uh, political clout. Got my credentials straight off the hands of the governor. Well, <laughs> it doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out. We could have worked any time my credentials were just, uh, I'd say, a gift from the governor. That if you have an, an officer that's gone through the academy, juiced through the academy is what we call it. Uh, my first year there was actually a learning process. Juiced through the probationary period. Along interrogation, picking up people, but it was mostly having a good time, nightclubbing. And then is set loose independently um, on the street. He is going to disgrace that badge and that uniform so fast. Prostitution, pill dealers, uh, marijuana dealers, cocaine dealers. The atrocities that were committed by myself and those who stand accused are unforgivable acts. Everything went back there. Everything was okay. The lines between right and wrong became fuzzy and indistinct. Are you your brother's keeper? You better believe it. Because what they do to them, they can do to you. Torture, extortion, mistreating people. And that has a wide brush because that's what everybody focuses on, okay? And what kind of crimes? And I'm talking not just policy violations, I'm talking about criminal activity. The us against them ethos of the overzealous cop began to consume me. Rape. And the, and the end seemed to justify the means. We had all the French benefits that came with it. I. Uh, had women left and right. I controlled a couple of bars. Uh, we had uh, most of our prostitution in our pockets. Everywhere we went, we had the French benefits. I only vaguely sensed that we were doing the wrong thing for the right reasons. Drug use. To do our job fairly was not enough. Prostitution. My job became an intoxicant that I lusted after. Sex trafficking. 
By then I began to lust also for things of the flesh. Murder. The end result, I cheated on my wife. I had the power in my pocket. I cheated on my employer. I was untouchable. And I cheated on all of you, the people of Los Angeles. You name it, this is what happens when you cut corners. It was a green light for me, 100%. It's here too. As I said, the Mexican government was willing to tell us who our bad guys were. And you would think an honest person would say, yes, you tell me, and I want it in writing, and I want witnesses. Don't just give it to me. Give it to a group of us so that we can do something about this. So these two guys went on with their careers. I saw another one later, and I said, whatever happened with that? He said, would you be surprised that nobody can find a copy of it now? Let me try to clear something up. I, if your name, was men your name is mentioned right. on it. Okay. Now, you work with these people, and you know them better than we do, that whole unit has drawn attention to himself. Perez, you know where he's at. Exactly. Okay. Now, whether you knew about it or didn't know about it, you are now somehow dragged into it. There's another situation where you're dragged into it. We don't know, okay? Well, I, I don't know either. Okay, now, I would be upset. I'd be really upset. Yeah. And I'd be the first saying, hey, I want to help. And you did say that. And I believe that. And you had information, you wanted to give Robert homicide, and you and you called him, okay? It seems, you go to your captain, you tell your captain, it seems like you're trying to do the right thing. But there's some weight keeping you down. That weight, that weight, I don't think it's your weight, all right? I don't think it's your bullshit. But somehow, you're caught up in it, and this is how, you know, LAPD is not known to be corrupt. We have an outstanding reputation. But when somebody is, they draw people in, get them dirty, now they can't say shit. And it's very apparent when somebody is dirty. Why was your name mentioned? regarding let's get rid of the guns. I have no idea. With four other officers that you guys work with. Well, I have no idea. And if someone thinks I'm going to get rid of guns for them, out of there. Police mind. officers talking about this. That, that's what... Well, it pisses me off too. That's I mean, why I'm saying if you know something about that, that maybe it's something innocent. I don't you know, know, I think we've been sitting in the room. I'd hope that you guys kind of see where I'm coming from. And whether you care to believe it, I can't control it. But like you said, you're passionate. I think I'm pretty passionate too. You know, I've had a goal for a long time. This is why I love working. This is why I want to work. I'm doing what I want to do. There is no person or no thing that I'm going to jeopardize that or not do anything stupid for them. You cannot correct attitudes or beliefs, but you can correct and demand behavior. So if you do that on government time, you're going to get whacked. You're going to get punished. You're going to lose your money or you might lose your job. Don't care what you think. Oh, you want me to love her? No, that's not my business. That's between you and the Lord. But how you behave towards other people, that can be demanded. We were in uh, Agua Prieta, and uh, we went into his house. They were gone. Uh, the food was warm. They left minutes before we got there. Somebody tipped them off. And well, since nobody was there, everybody started loading up the truck with, everybody, with this guy's furniture. And they took it. But for their bad luck, as soon as they got to ours, the commander liked what he saw and he took it away from them. We're, you know, you're supposed to answer to us. We're the citizens. And the Bill of Rights was written to protect the citizen from his government. I can't really hurt the government, but the government can hurt me. I'm one little mouse. And I said, if you do me, this to me, an FBI guy who's supposed to be on the end, what can you do to the average bear? In the same, in the, in the same office, we had conflicts with other people. Um, the commander back then was a very good friend of my father. He was a very good friend of the governor, very good friend of Pepe, which was my one of my godfathers. 
Now Pepe is the same person that used to uh, own that West Wing jet. We used to fly all over Mexico. And, um, there was a lot of envy, a lot of envy. Uh, I did not get the support that I needed from Director Webster, and I say that very honestly and clearly. And with uh, his top men, uh, Buck Ravel and some of these others who were became my nemesis, in that I was told that terrorism was number 11 priority nationally. White collar crime, organized crime, crimes on government reservations were higher priority. I said, it's number one down here. They said, well, you can't burn, you can't be using federal funds on something that's number 12 priority. And I said, we're going to do it. So I focused everything on terrorism and on police corruption. Interdiction team, let's say, comes up with the money and the dope that the Nevada uh, Division of Investigations, Metro, uh, uh, Metro Police, uh, uh, the Nevada Highway Patrol, the DEA, they all take a piece of this seized property, including uh, sometimes the vehicles themselves too. Okay, who gets, uh, who gets this uh, vehicle? You know, who gets to use this vehicle? In, in other operations, okay? And I would not, I would hate to even want to believe that dope was placed illegally in innocent people's vehicles just in order to uh, get a twist on them, okay? Now, an innocent person's vehicle or an innocent person is, needs to be defined. Now, if this innocent person has a record of let's say 10 narcotics arrests. But this particular time, he doesn't have any dope or money in it or contraband in his vehicle. What I'm saying is the dope will find his way into that vehicle so that they can, they got the twist on him, okay? And that person will now work off his arrest, his phony arrest. Uh, I remember uh, Caro Quintero, when he was arrested in Costa Rica, he turned around and told the Florentino Ventura, if you let me go, I'll pay off the Mexican debt to the United States. <laughs> <laughs> That's how it was. Were you working with, uh, with Calderoni? Guillermo Gonzalez Calderoni, who was killed later. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant man. Then I went back when uh, another commander by the name of Guillermo Gonzalez Calderoni came into the picture. That's where we started dealing with Pablo Acosta. But uh, what I mean by dealing with him, we started looking for him because we had orders from Mexico City to take him down. With all of the comandantes and all of the agents in charge, the border agents in charge, refreshing. We talked. Mr. Ravel shows up again. Sir, this is just supposed to be a working meeting with the working troops. Oh yes, uh, what's your agenda? So we don't have one. We don't want one. We just want to talk. Well, we have to. We can't do this because we have to get translators in here. I said these men all speak English. The Mexicans, and they said, Yeah, we do. We need a translator in here. We've got to be vetted and all this. I said, no, we're not going to do it. So everybody's just standing there in a room. We're down in a holiday and I think in Tucson. So I got up and I said in Spanish to the comandantes and they had some of the people from the Attorney General's office. I said, we think that all of you are corrupt. And they just looked at me. And I said in Spanish, and you think that all of us are stupid. And they began laughing. Then they started, the hands started going up. Yeah, and we've got more dead Mexican soldiers and dead Mexican policemen, good, honest ones, than you do. And we know who the crooks are in this room, but you don't know who the crooks are on your side. But we're not going to tell you unless you do something about it. That's how we began. And Mr. Abel was listening to beepers and things like that. He didn't know what to do. That's how we talked for a day. And then Calderoni, without getting into another big story, 
told us how he laundered six million dollars in one day through Caesar's palace legally because he said your president Reagan and Laxalt the senator exempted the biggest bank in America which is called Las Vegas so we bring the money there they wash it we give them a fee and it goes to the banks in Switzerland and what are you going to do about it the LVMPD has had a little problem with um, stashed dope, okay? Dope that's put in a innocent person's vehicle, and uh, it could be a small amount, it could be a large amount. Uh, the LVMPD has these two kilos of cocaine that have surfaced on three different occasions. That same two kilos of cocaine have surfaced on three different locations or and incidents that I'm aware of, and again, I'm just a messenger, and have gotten a lot of people in trouble, caused them to uh, be arrested. And then, of course, you got the plea deal that uh, and once they got you, uh, it's up to you if you want to spend uh, a good portion of your life in prison, or you can plea to something lesser or uh, be turned into an informant. And this is all from dope that was planted in your vehicle or in your house or, or any, anywhere else. And this is how the narcotics section uh, extorts people. After the meeting, Mr. Ravel says, gentlemen, to all the FBI, this, what we just heard, is classified top secret. And I laughed. I said, you cannot classify anything that does not pertain to the national security of a country. You can't. And you cannot classify that which is embarrassing. Oh no, this, this gentleman, this cannot leave this room. I said, we should publish this in all the newspapers so everybody knows how this, we've got people dying out here and we're up snatching up half a ton of marijuana and we're all initialing it and think it's all great we're all heroes and that cars are going through with black tar heroin and cocaine there was something i never agreed on was with heroin that's a killer uh, I, that's something i never wanted to know anything about or deal with uh, those people well i just didn't like it said so there's no war on drugs we're just killing people because when we get to the big ones, you don't want to hear about it. The big banks and how the Federal Reserve is involved in this. Oh, I think I have a meeting now. I said there's corruption on both sides and they'll tell us who it is. Didn't you hear it? I think I've got to catch my plane now. Detectives are unique in that their minds are always dealing with the case, even when they're at home. And so I have this uh, huge amount of respect for investigators 
no matter which police agency they're at, because they are the cream of the crop when it comes to going out and solving things that are almost impossible to solve. Now, getting back to Russell, Russell was, a, was following in the footstep of his dad, uh, and he was able to uh, work through the LAPD and have all the things that had to be done within the LAPD. He certainly knew the streets very well, and uh, circumstances in his case were far more tragic because he was killed in the line of duty. Now, maybe it could have been blood, and it wasn't something at the time that I really paid that much attention to. Um, you know, it's not a room that I use that much, so I, it's probably the first time I've ever been in that room. We usually, I usually room, use the viewers downstairs, so I don't know what had been there, what wasn't there in the past, or you know, or prior to my going in there. But I think, you know, the best there was a little bit of some type of markings or splatterings on the wall, and it wasn't, you know, I didn't walk into a room that was covered in blood or anything. It wasn't even anything that I thought of yesterday because when you were asking me. I was thinking the rug, which is what you were saying, you know, or is there blood on the rug? And I know I never saw the blood on the rug. And so that, I was never thinking of anything else, the wall or anything like that. My, based on the question, my whole focus was the rug, the rug, the rug. And then when I could stop and gather my thoughts and think about more than that and realize that we're just, you know, un get out of the tunnel vision, I remember maybe there might have been something on the back wall. As, you know, I don't know how you want to call it, but on the wall. We have to go after those things. You don't have to be, not crusaders, that's not good, but you have to. Something goes wrong, you fix it, and you follow it up so it doesn't happen again. It's not magic. And you're not, I don't want you to go hang them all, but hey, you did something wrong, you're gonna pay for it. You're not gonna get that promotion, or you're gonna have to pay some money. You have to apologize to certain people, then you have to fix them. You know, they were hurt. Well, okay, they got hurt. Well, I, I don't need an apology, but fix it so it doesn't happen again. Yeah.